Here we go. Okay, so unfortunately, I can't call on you, which is good for some of you. You don't want to be called on. But I'm going to show a case with a few slides, and then I'll just ask you for the answer. So I don't know how you want to do it. You want people to type so, it in? Yeah, so we, we'll ask people to type in the chat box, and usually the fastest finger wins, the fastest finger first, something like that. Something I'll, let like you, I'll let you run the chat box, okay? Yes, all right. Cases are obvious. These are the routine cases Linda and I see every day. Okay. Patient presents, 50-ish year old male presents with FUO. I'll show you a couple images. I think one of the things, and I'll just speak over it, is look at the spleen. What's going on? There was no calcifications in the spleen on the non-contrast scan. There's the spine. Here's some of the 3D showing you the spleen, the extensive ascites. And here's the venous phase. Right, I think that's very good. If you go back, first of all, you see the sclerotic bone lesions. Then you have this vascular lesion in the spleen. You can get hemangiomas can be vascular, but this is diffusely vascular. You have ascites and you have widespread blastic bone lesions. And as you, somebody suggested, that was an angiosarcoma. Very good. Believe it or not, we've had three cases of angiosarcoma in the last four or five months. So, you know, we hardly see them, but we have been seeing them lately. They're exceedingly rare. Okay. Uh, they can cause splenic rupture, uh, but it's rare. You can see this one article here with 12 cases in radiology. So a pretty uncommon uh, the lesions may exhibit substantial enhancement. And again, you can think about hemangioma, but just the pattern does not really look like hemangioma. Hemangiomas are better defined. Okay, very good. Okay, in this case, patient presents 50-ish year old, acute abdomen, ER, rule out the section. That's why we did the study. Again, impressive spleen. Okay. And uh, you can see that high density zone, big spleen. So we've got, answers, from, yeah, we've got answers from Raghuram saying splenic rupture, then there's splenic hematoma and AML rupture. Right. So, so I guess it's good to say the splenic rupture, but patient was not a trauma patient. Why, I guess the part, second answer would be why the patient has uh, acute bleeding and splenic rupture. I mean, obviously trauma is the most common reason for splenic rupture and splenic bleed, but there was no trauma. So um, the spleen looks enlarged. Some of that is the blood. It's sort of a modeled enhancement pattern as well. Looks like something's infiltrating, perhaps. Here it is on the uh, cinematic with this infiltration of the splenic tissue, the blood, the act of bleeding, and diagnosis, CLL, presenting with acute bleed. So kind of a great case, okay. Okay, another patient, left upper quadrant pain. This is something you may see more frequently than we do, but maybe not. Um, so nice, and look at the bone is a good hint. And I'm gonna keep going down. There's in the pelvis, you see the big spleen. But what's happening in the presacral space as well? So we have answers coming sir, thick and fast actually. So. Picture frame vertebra, sickle cell, splenomegaly, hepatosplenos, thalassemia, lymphoma. These are the answers we've got. Sir. Right. So someone got it right. I mean, so the thing over here, the stuff in the pre-spinal uh, region, what is that? So a big spleen, sclerotic bone lesions, almost like a bone in bone. But the soft tissue density is really the critical question. What is this? You could say maybe it's adenopathy. But that's a classic appearance for extramedullary hematopoiesis. And this was a classic case of thalassemia with extramedullary hematopoiesis. Very good. Okay. Another patient. Looks similar, but not the same. Back pain. 
back pain in a 60 year old. Right, a very classic location for chordoma infiltrating. I showed this compared to the last case, which was extramedullary hematopoiesis. Here it's a much more aggressive soft tissue mass and a much different appearance to the bone. Here it is nicely on cinematic as well. You can see that infiltration of the bone really nicely shown. And this was a chordoma. Okay, very good. And again, chordoma, you know, uh, C5, the lower cervical spine, but the presacral region is really where we uh, typically like to see it, okay? Um, so a very, very nice, nice appearance there. And again, um, uh, not an uncommon diagnosis, but uh, so something good to be able to recognize. Okay, what about this case? This is a 30-ish year old female with abdominal pain. Again, more than 95% desmoid. One says endometriosis. Damn, you guys are good. You must have been watching my, uh, no, no. There's <laughs> masses in the rectus muscle, enhancing masses down here. All right, you follow it down. Mo abdominal pain with multiple masses that are enhancing. You know, m masses in the abdominal wall, I like to think about desmoid tumors are a possibility. You can think about sarcomas. But endometriosis is one of the things that gives you enhancing lesions. Typically, it's patients who've had prior C-sections or prior surgeries. Uh, there's a wide differential for abdominal wall masses, but one of them is endometriosis. Very good. So I won't go th through those slides in, the, in order to save some time. Very good. And it's just a differential diagnosis, but um, it's good to think about endometriosis because you can make a, it's a great diagnosis. Okay, good. Patient with weight loss. The next few are going to be bowel. And I'm going to give you the, I'm going to give you this duana lipoma. Okay, weight loss and GI bleeding. So I guess you see a nice measurement there. Here it is, cinematic. So what are we thinking about? What a mixed bag, actually. There's uh, liposarcoma, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, idle mass carcinoma, Crohn's, right. lymphoma. Right, very good. So yeah, that's a differential. Uh, it's focal. This ended up being adenocarcinoma, um, but it could be lymphoma. If it was Crohn's, I would have worried about Crohn's developing a carcinoma because the, the wall thickness. Okay, good. So now I'll show you again, following that differential, here's another patient, abdominal pain. So similar, but different. We're getting gist and lymphoma as the answer for this. Right. This was B-cell lymphoma. It's much bulkier. I think that's one of the helpful th things with lymphoma. Often you see nodes, but not always, but the bulkiness. Okay. Small bowel lymphoma. Very good. What about this patient? Abdominal pain and drop in and a low hematocrit. Okay. So we're going to look. Looks like some nodes also. So what about this one? What do people think? Yeah, so this angiodysplasia, AML, adenocea, intussusception, colonic carcinoma, right. fecal That's mass good. with intussusception. So the other differential. Right, it's good differential. I mean, so something's involving the colon and the small bowel. Whenever I see a colon and small bowel, although we know adenocarcinoma can grow into the cecum and cecum, uh, adenocarcinoma, the cecum can grow into bowel, with those extra nodes present, I always like to think about lymphoma. And this was B-cell lymphoma of the cecum. Okay. All right. With that, let me show you another one. Fever and right lower quadrant pain. Answers are coming from uh, appendicular mass, gist, lymphoma, appendicular lymphoma, 
Right. Bulky tumor. I just, uh, I put this one in with the other one. Nice pet positive. This was B cell lymphoma of the cecum. Kind of interesting. The difference between the prior study, which showed a smaller mass and this larger mass present here, and then getting away from the cecum patient presents with abdominal pain and weight loss. Here's a, looks very similar, right? Except uh, it's not, looks like it's more the stomach, right? And answer. So again, we're getting mainly gist actually, and small yeah. bone lymphoma. Yeah, I, I think uh, gist is a good thought, you know. But then when you realize it's really a big ulceration in the stomach, but gist often ulcerate. Uh, bulky. This was gastric lymphoma. Uh, uh, my first thought would have been gist too that it's an ulceration. Just commonly ulcerate. They're very large, but. Gastric lymphoma can be very bulky, and this was a really, really nice example of gastric lymphoma. Left lower quadrant pain. Again, uh, answers are like carcinoid, diverticulitis, paniculitis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this, right, but this is coming off the right. This is coming off the small bowel, right? It looks like diverticulitis, and in fact, it is. But it's not your typical colonic diverticulitis. It's small bowel diverticulitis, specifically jejunal diverticulitis, which is far less common. Uh, often looks like a perforation. Um, it's pretty rare. Uh, patients uh, are treated typically conservatively, so it's an important diagnosis to make. Uh, we wrote this article like a lifetime ago, but we see cases every once in a while. And what about this case? I think I'm gonna, I think I have two cases left. This may be the last, next to the last one. Patient presents with GI bleed. I'm just, and then here it is, or the, it's rule out GI bleed. It's it has a history of GI bleeding. Okay. And here's the, the MIP imaging, which I really like for looking for sources of bleeding. The patient has no positive oral contrast. So, um, Answers say colon diverticulitis and angiodysplasia, sigmoid diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis. These are the differentials. And, and, and I 100% agree. What's interesting here is you have bleeding in multiple sites. Now, most of the time we do GI bleeding, CT is 95% accurate, but usually it's one site of bleeding. And if I only saw this, I would say diverticulitis probably is the cause. This patient has multiple sites of bleeding it ends up when you get the full history, this patient, I think, had leukemia and was on checkpoint inhibitors. So I show this case to make the point that patients who are on immune therapy can present with GI bleeding, and often it's multiple areas of GI bleeding. And that's what happens with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We're seeing that used a lot. I'm sure it's being used a lot in India as well for a range of tumors very successfully, but there are a lot of complications with checkpoint inhibitors, including a colonic bleeding and multifocal sites of GI bleeding as in this case. So it's something good to think about and I won't go through those slides. Okay, and then I'm gonna, we're gonna end with this case. This is suspected GI bleed in a patient with ALL. Okay. And I'm showing this case because I made some really good cinematics the other day. So pseudomembranous colitis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, shock bowel, pancolitis, neutropenic uh, state, radiation enteritis. Neutropenic colitis. These are the answers we're getting. Those are all great thoughts. It's kind of, I mean, this patient in ALL, this patient had a bone marrow transplant previously. So, right, you, you know, it has a nice uh, target sign, could be ischemia, could be inflammatory, could be infectious. Uh, very impressive looking ileum, very impressive vasa recta. And in patients with bone marrow transplants, graft versus host disease is one of the things that can occur. Fortunately, these days, graft versus host is less common because of different therapies that are given, but it can occur. 
And this is a case of graft versus host disease. Okay. So I'll stop there and I will thank everybody for their attention. And I especially would like to thank the organizers for the invite.